chapter. I have to always like, because it's in Roman numerals, I like have to do the math. 10, 15, 16, 17, 18. Chapter 18. In the jackdaw, the in the jackdaw's nest. This, said the gump in a squeaky voice, not at all proportioned to the size of his great body. This is the most novel experience I've ever heard of. The last thing I remember distinctly is walking through the forest and hearing a loud noise. Something probably killed me then. And it certainly ought to have been the end of me. Yet here I am, alive again, with four monstrous wings, and a body which I venture to say would make any respectable animal or fowl weep with shame to own. What does it all mean? I am a gump. Or I am a juggernaut. I don't know what any of that meant either. The creature, as it spoke, wiggled its chin whiskers in a very comical manner. You're just a thing, answered Tip, with a gump's head on it. And and we have made you and brought you to life so you may carry us through the air wherever we wish to go. Very good, said the thing. As I am not a gump, I cannot have a gump's pride or independent spirit. So I may as well become your servant as anything else. My only satisfaction is that I do not have a very strong constitution, and I am not likely to live long in a state of slavery. Uh, Don't say that, I beg of you, cried the Tin Woodman, who apparently is fine with slavery, uh, whose excellent heart was strongly affected by this sad speech. Uh, Are you not feeling well today? Oh, as for that, returned the gump, it is the first day of existence, so I cannot judge whether I am feeling well or ill. And it waved its broom tail to and fro in a pensive manner. Come, come, said the scarecrow kindly. Do try to be more cheerful and take life as you find it. Whew, a tough challenge from the scarecrow that we would all do well to remember. We shall be kind masters, and we will strive to render your existence as pleasant as possible. Are you willing to carry us through the air wherever we wish to go? Okay, what if he says no? Like, Certainly, answered the gump. I prefer greatly to navigate the air, for should I travel on the earth and meet one of my own species, my embarrassment would be something awful. I can appreciate that, said the Tin Woodman sympathetically. And that, the thing continued, when I carefully look at you, my masters, none of you seem to be constructed much more artistically than I am. Appearances are deceitful, said the Wobblebug earnestly. I am both... Highly magnified and thoroughly educated. Indeed, indeed he is. Indeed, murmured the gump indifferently. The gump doesn't care if you're educated or think you're educated. And my brains are considered remarkably rare specimens, added the scarecrow proudly. How strange remarked the gump. Oh, they're strange indeed. Although I am of tin, said the woodman, I own a heart altogether the warmest and most admirable in the whole world. I am delighted to hear it, replied the gump with a slight cough. (laughs) My smile, said Jack Pumpkinhead, is worthy of your best attention. It is always the same. A simper idiom explained the Wobblebug pompously, and the gump turned to stare at him. Yeah, that doesn't... Just quoting Latin doesn't explain it any better. And I, declared the sawhorse, filling in an awkward pause, am only remarkable because I can't help it. 
I'm I am quite remarkable myself. I am proud indeed to meet such exceptional masters," said the gump in a careless tone. "If I could but secure so complete an introduction to myself, I would be more than satisfied." "That will come in time," remarked the scarecrow. "To know thyself is quite an accomplishment which it has taken us, who we are elders, months to perfect." It does take months to truly, I guess. Okay. But now, he added, turning to the others, let us get aboard and start upon our journey. Where shall we go? Asked Tip as he clambered to a seat on the sofa and assisted the pumpkin head to follow him. In the south country rules a very delightful queen called Glinda the Good whom I am sure will gladly receive us, said the scarecrow, getting into the thing clumsily. Let us go to her and ask her advice. Yeah, I mean, we took her advice last time, and it was like, hey, Dorothy, instead of going home, follow a a road that's yellow. That is cleverly thought of, declared Nick Chopper, giving the wobble bug a boost, and then toppling the sawhorse into the rear end of the cushioned seats. I know Glinda the Good, and she will prove a, a friend indeed. Are we all ready? asked the boy. Uh, yes, announced the tin woodman, seating himself beside the scarecrow. Then, said Tip, addressing the gump, be kind enough to fly with us to the southward, and do not go higher than the escape the houses in the work. And do not go higher than to escape the houses and trees, for it makes me dizzy to be up so far. All right, answered the gump briefly. It flopped its four huge wings and rose slowly into the air, and then, while the little band of adventurers clung to the backs and the sides of the sofas for support, the gump turned toward the south and soared swiftly and majestically away. The scenic effect from this altitude is marvelous, commented the educated Wobblebug as they rode along. Hey, that's the name of the book, The Marvelous Land of Oz. Not, I'll be honest, a great title for this book. But hey, there could be worse. Never mind the scenery, said the Scarecrow. Hold on tight or you may get a tumble. (laughs) The the thing seems to rock badly. It will be dark soon, said Tip, observing the sun was low on the horizon. Perhaps we should have waited until morning. I wonder if the gump can fly in the night. I've been wondering that myself, returned the gump quietly. You see, this is a new experience to me. I used to have legs that carried me swiftly over the ground, but now I feel my legs as if they were asleep. They are, said Tip. We didn't bring them to life. You're expected to fly, explained the scarecrow, not to walk. The Aryans are just like, Hi, I'm the scarecrow who is, you know, stuck in a field, and now for some reason, decided to rule the whole country, and I'm better than you. We can walk ourselves, said the wobble bug. I begin to understand what's required of me, remarked the gump, so I will do my best to please you, and he flew on for a time in silence. Presently, Jack Pumpkinhead became uneasy. I wonder if riding through the air is liable to spoil the pumpkins? He said, Not unless you carelessly drop your head over the side, said the Wobblebug. In that event, your head would no longer be a pumpkin, for it would become a squash. That's that's dark. It's probably his best joke yet, but it's still not, not great. Have I not asked you to restrain from these unfeeling jokes? Demanded Tip looking at the wobble bug with a severe expression. You have, 
and I restrained a good many of them, replied the insect. But there are opportunities for so many excellent puns in our language that to an educated person like myself, the temptation to express them is almost irresistible. I do sometimes like to, like, make some lizard puns. People with more or less education discovered those puns centuries ago, said Tip. Are, are you sure? asked the Wobblebug with a startled look. Of course I am, answered the boy. An educated Wobblebug may be a new thing, but a Wobblebug education is as old as the hills, judging from the display you make of it. Yeah, he went to what, one one class and decided he was thoroughly educated. The insect seemed much impressed by this remark, and for a time remained in a meek silence. And the scarecrow, shifting in his seat, saw the cushions of the pepper box which Tip had cast aside and began to examine it. Throw it overboard, said the boy. It's quite empty now and there's no use in keeping it. Mm. Is it really empty? asked the scarecrow, looking curiously into the box. Well, of course it is, answered Tip. I shook out every grain of the powder. Then the box has two bottoms, announced the scarecrow. Therefore, the bottom on the inside is fully an inch away from the bottom on the outside. Well, let me see, said the tin woodman taking the box from his friend. Uh, yes, he declared after looking it over. The thing it certainly has a false bottom. Now I wonder what that is for. Well, can't you get it apart and find out? inquired Tip, now quite interested in the mystery. Why, yes, the lower bottom unscrews, said the Tin Woodman. Uh, my fingers are rather stiff. Uh, please see if, if you can open it. He handed the pepper box to Tip who had no difficulty in unscrewing the bottom, and in the cavity below were three silver pills with a carefully folded paper lying underneath them. The paper the boy proceeded to unfold, taking care not to spill the pills, and found several lines clearly written in red ink. Read it aloud, said the scarecrow. So Tip reads as follows. <clears throat> Dr. Nicodes, Nicodex, Dr. Nicodex celebrated wishing pills. Directions for use. Swallow one pill, count seventeen by twos, and then make a wish. The wish will immediately be granted. Caution, keep in a dry and dark place. Why? This is a very valuable discovery, cried the scarecrow. Oh, it is indeed, replied Tip gravely. These pills may be of great use to us. I wonder if old Mumbai knew that they were in the bottom of the pepper box. I remember her hearing she said that she got the powder of life from this same Nicky Dick. He must be a powerful sorcerer, exclaimed the tin woodman. And this powder proves a success, uh, so we ought to have confidence in the pills. But how? asked the scarecrow. Can anyone count to seventeen by twos? Seventeen is an odd number. Huh, it is true, replied Tip, greatly disappointed. No one can possibly count to seventeen by twos. Then these pills are of no use to us, uh, wailed the pumpkin head. And this fact overwhelms me with grief, for I had intended wishing that my head would never spoil. Nonsense, said the scarecrow sharply. If we could use the pills at all, we would make far better wishes than that. What would you make, scarecrow? Ask for some brains. <laughs> I do not see how I could use it any better, protested poor Jack. If you were liable to spoil at any time, you would understand my 
anxiety. For my part, said the Tin Woodman, I sympathize you. Uh, I sympathize with you in every respect. But since we cannot count as seventeen by two's uh, sympathy is all you're liable to get. So we we that was pretty much a waste of a page of this book. Ah oh, well. By this time it had become dark, quite dark, and the voyagers found above them a clouded sky through which the rays of the moon could not penetrate, and for some reason the huge sofa body rocked more and more dizzily every hour. The wobble bug declared he was seasick, seasick in the sky, and Tip was also pale and somewhat distressed. But the others clung to the backs of the sofa and did not seem to mind the motion as long as they were not tipped out. Darker and darker grew the night, and on and on sped the gump through the black heavens. The travelers could not even see one another, and an oppressive silence settled down upon them. After a long time, Tip, who had been thinking deeply, spoke. How are we to know when we come to the palace of Glinda the Good? he asked. And palace is spelled P-A-L-L-A-C-E, uh, which is not how you spell palace. But, but <laughs> I don't know if this got proofread or not. It's a long way to Glinda's place, answered the woodman. I've traveled it. But how are we to know how fast the gump is flying, persisted the boy. We cannot see a single, a single thing. <laughs> We cannot see a single thing down on the earth, and before morning we may be far beyond the place that we want to reach. Mm, that is true enough, the scarecrow replied, a little uneasy. But I do not see that we can stop just now, for we might uh, alight in a river or on top of a steeple, and that would be a great disaster. So they permitted the gump to fly on with regular flops of the great wings and waited patiently for morning. Then Tip's fears were provoked to be well-founded, for the first streaks of the gray dawn looked over the sides of the sofa and discovered rolling plains dotted with queer villages where the houses, instead of being dome-shaped like they are in the land of Oz, had slanting roofs that rose to a peak in the center. And odd-looking animals were also moving about on the open plains, and the country was unfamiliar to both the Tin Woodman and the Scarecrow, who had formerly visited Glinda the Good's domain and knew it well. We are lost, said the Scarecrow dolefully. The gump must have carried us entirely out of the land of Oz and over the sandy desert into the terrible world outside that Dorothy told us about. We must get back, exclaimed the Tin Woodman earnestly. Oh, we must get back as soon as possible. Uh, turn around, turn around, cried Tip to the gump. Uh, turn as quickly as you can. If I do, I shall upset, answered the gump. I'm not used to fly, and the best plan for me to alight in some place, and then I can turn around and take a fresh start. Just then, however, there seemed to be no stopping place that would answer their purpose. They flew over a city so big that the wobble bug declared it was a city, and then they came to a range of high mountains with many deep gorges and steep cliffs showing plainly. Now is our chance to stop, said the boy, finding they were very close to the mountain tops. Then he turned to the gump and commanded, Stop at the first level place, you see. Very well, answered the gump, and settled down upon a table of rock that stood between the two cliffs. But not being very experienced in such matters, the gump did not judge his speed correctly, and instead of coming to a stop upon the flat rock, uh, he missed it with half the width of his body, breaking off his right wings against the sharp edge of the rock, and then tumbling over and over down the cliff. Our friends held onto the sofa as long as they could, but when the gump caught on a projecting rock, the thing suddenly stopped bottom side up and all were immediately dumped out. By good fortune, they only fell a few feet, for underneath them was a monster nest built by a colony of jackdaws in a hollow ledge of rock, so none of them, even the pumpkin head, was injured by the fall. 
for Jack had found his precious head resting on the soft breast of the scarecrow, which made an excellent cushion, and Tip fell on a mass of leaves and papers which saved him from injury. The wobblebug had bumped his round head against the sawhorse, but without causing him more than a moment's inconvenience. The tin woodman was first very much alarmed, but after finding he had escaped without even a scratch upon his beautiful nickel plate, he at once regained his accustomed cheerfulness and turned to address his comrades. Our journey has ended rather suddenly, he said. Thanks for that, Ted Woodman. And we cannot justly blame our friend the Gump for the accident because uh, he did not uh, he did not know he did the best he could under the circumstances. Uh, but how are we ever to escape from this nest? Uh, I must leave it to someone with better brains than I possess. Here he gazed at the scarecrow, who crawled to the edge of the nest and looked over. How about those those wishing bells? Below was a sheer precipice several hundred feet in depth. Above them was a smooth cliff, unbroken, save by the point of the rock where the wretched body of the gump still hung suspended from the end of one of the sofas. There really seemed to be no means of escape, and as they realized their helpless plight, the little band of adventurers gave way to their bewilderment. This is a worse prison than the palace, sadly remarked the Wobblebug. I wish we had stayed there, moaned Jack. I am afraid of the mountain air. It isn't good for pumpkins. It won't be when the jackdaws come back, growled the sawhorse, which lay waving its legs in a vain endeavor to get back on its feet again. Jackdaws are especially fond of pumpkins. How does he know? Do you think the birds will come here? asked Jack, much distressed. Of course they will, said Tip, for it is their nest, and there must be hundreds of them, he continued, for, see, what a lot of things they have brought here. Indeed, the nest was half filled with a most curious collection of small articles, for which the birds could have no use, but which the thieving jackdaws had stolen many years from the homes of men. And the nest was safely hidden where no human being could reach it, this lost property would never be recovered. The wobble bug searching among the rubbish, for the jackdaws stole useless things as well as valuable ones, turned up with his foot in a beautiful diamond necklace. This was so greatly admired by the tin woodman that the wobble bug presented it to him with a graceful speech, after which the woodman hung it around his neck with much pride, rejoicing exceedingly when the big diamonds glittered in the sun's rays. But now they heard a great jabbering and flopping of wings as the ground grew nearer to them, Tip exclaimed, The jackdaws are coming, and if they find us here, they will surely kill us in their anger. I was afraid of this, moaned the pumpkin head. And my time has come. And also mine, said the wolf bug, for the jackdaws are the greatest enemies of my race. The others were not afraid at all, but the Scarecrow once decided to save those of the party who were liable to be injured by the angry birds, so he commanded Tip to take off Jack's head huh? and lie down with it at the bottom of the nest, and when he had done this, he ordered the Wobblebug to lie beside Tip. Nick Chopper, who knew from past experience just what to do, then took the Scarecrow to pieces, all except his head, and scattered the straw all over Tip and the wobble bug completely covering their bodies. Hardly had this been accomplished when the flock of jackdaws reached them. Perceiving the intruders in their nest, the birds flew down upon them with screams of rage. <laughs>